Listen to me. Now, Jake, the guy's become an embarrassment. He's embarrassing me with certain people, and I'm looking very bad. I can't deliver a kid from my own damn neighborhood. Listen with him. Why does he have to make it so hard on himself? For Christ's sake, he comes to me and make it easier for him. The man's got a head of rock. You know, it's hard to explain, Tom. He's... Jack respects you. I mean, he's... he don't even say hello to anybody. You know, he always talks to, he likes you. It's just that uh, when he gets something on his mind, you know, he's got a hard head, he likes to do things his own way. I mean, Jesus Christ could come off the cross sometimes. He don't give a f He's going to do what he wants to do. He wants to make it on his own, you know? Thinks he can make it on his own. Make it on his own. He thinks he's going to walk in there and become champion on his own. Right? Yeah, huh? it's crazy. Yeah, it's he's nice. crazy. And he's got no respect for nobody. He doesn't listen to nobody. That's not crazy. I respect you. Don't he me. doesn't That's... respect anybody. Now, you do this for me, you understand? You tell him. I don't care how colorful he is, how great he is. He could beat all the Sugar Ray Robinsons and the Tony Janeiros in the world, but he ain't gonna get a shot at that title, not without us, he ain't. You've landed on The Substance, a podcast aimed at being biblical, thoughtful, and human. Join us every other week as we engage the culture without the culture war. I'm your host, Philip Marinello, and I'm very excited to have you guys here for a very special substantive cinema here. We're covering Martin Scorsese's Raging Bull. This is our first Scorsese that we're covering on the pod, and I'm extremely excited to let you guys all know that this week our Raging Bull episode is brought to you by Screenland Armor in North Kansas City, Kansas City's hometown cinema. Many times voted best local theater in Kansas City. I heartily agree. It's my favorite theater. Um, Pretty much, I checked my letterbox. I usually log the where I see films in the theater. And I think every single movie this year and last year that I saw in the theater that I paid for, uh, I went to Screenland. Not that I <laughs> sneak in or don't pay. Sometimes we get screenings because of the podcast or if I watch movies when I'm traveling. But every time I've been in Kansas City and have paid for and chose where I've seen a movie, it's been Screenland. It's my one of my favorite places in the whole city. It's just a, an incredible place. If you're in Kansas City and you love movies, check out Screenland Armor. So we're happy to partner with them. And if you're listening to this episode day of, we're probably actually going to release this episode a little early because at 3.45 uh, Sunday afternoon, the day of release, so that is uh, Sunday, the day that this gets published, 3.45 p.m., I'm actually going to be hosting and introducing. They are screening the new 4K restoration that Criterion used for their release, and I think there's maybe some other releases overseas. So that 4K new restoration print is the one they're going to be showing at Screenland. I'm going to be there in person introducing the movie, kind of in partnership with this episode. So very excited for that. I'm also really excited this week uh, because I'm joined by local Kansas City film critic Abby Olchesi. Uh Abby writes for The Pitch as well as Think Christian, Sojourners, uh, even RogerEbert.com. So she jumped on to talk with me this week. She's also, we talk about it at the end of the show, she has a book coming out with IVP, Silver Screen Liturgies. I'm very excited about that. Uh, that's going to be a film recommended films throughout the year to kind of go along in partnership with the church calendar. So that book doesn't come out till next year. We talk about that at the end of the show. So very excited for this one. Hope you guys, uh, if you guys want to watch along with us and you haven't seen it yet, if you want to watch it before the movie, uh, you can find it currently streaming on <laughs> formerly HBO max. Now just max. I feel very silly saying stream it on max, but uh, that's where you can find it now or, or rent it or purchase it. If you're like me and like physical media, the Blu-ray and the 4K out from Criterion is incredible. Um, so if you haven't checked it out, those are the ways to do it. And I will give you a heads up if listeners haven't checked it out yet. Uh, the movie's pretty challenging. It's 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 a little bit rough. It's a little brutal, as you maybe heard in uh, the intro there. It is not something that is pretty and pleasant, but I think it's something that is very humane and very valuable if you're 
willing and interested to engage with it. So if you haven't seen it, go check it out. If you don't care about that or if you've already seen it, I uh, hope you enjoy my conversation here with Abby on Martin Scorsese's Raging Bull. All right, Abby, welcome to The Substance. We're glad to have you here. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Uh, ex- I'm really excited. This is the first. We've done probably about um, just under two dozen of these substantive cinema episodes, and this is our first Scorsese on the pod, and I'm I'm very excited to have you with us for that. Yeah, thanks. I'm uh, I've I've been watching a little more Scorsese lately. Uh, between Killers of the Flower Moon coming out later this year, and also mm. uh, the book that I'm writing. Um, one of the movies that I'm highlighting for it is The Last Temptation of Christ. So I had, uh, right before watching Raging Bull, I I had watched Last Temptation, um, like a couple of days before. So I'm I'm right in the Scorsese Schrader pocket right now. Nice. Are you going to stay in there? I mean, we've got Master Gardener coming out. Scorsese's got After Hours is coming out soon on Criterion. Oh, I, I probably will be. Yeah, uh, I'm excited about Master Gardener. Um, the Criterion edition of uh, After Hours, which is a movie I love, is coming out on my actual birthday. So like that. OK, was that was you. I was like, I wasn't sure. I remember seeing somebody say that. That's very cool. I'm I think it is a phenomenal movie. I'm very excited about it. I do roll my eyes a little bit when people say it's Scorsese's best movie because uh, mm. we're talking about Raging Bull tonight. I think that's his actual best movie, but it's an incredible movie. I'm glad that a lot of people are discovering that Scorsese isn't just about like dark and brooding gangsters. Like it's a phenomenal film and I can't wait to see what Criterion does with that. Yeah, I'm really excited for it. And the cover art is just it's outstanding. Gorgeous. So I yeah, I think I'm gonna love everything about that edition. And Master Gardener coming out soon here. I think so when this episode is airing for the folks, especially the folks in Kansas City listening to it, it's first run. I think Master Gardener just came out the previous week, and then Raging Bull is actually playing this weekend. So if you listen to it day of, uh, I'm pretty sure it's playing tomorrow. That's yeah, that's a heck of a double feature. That's would be i, I, I feel like there would be a lot of really profound thoughts coming out of that i think i'm going to try to do that by the time this airs i may have already seen master gardener and i'll probably be on my way to seeing raging bull and the first so this is also Schrader. this is the second Schrader we've done our very first i have not gone back to re-listen to it uh this is episode probably 127 or 128 Episode three, uh, the first substantive cinema we ever did was first reform. So we're <laughs> we're back to Schrader here. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a good one. I think that might have been my first like knowledgeable Schrader where I was like going to watch it knowing that he was involved in it instead of like growing up watching a lot of earlier Scorsese movies where I found out later that he had worked on the script. So that was that was a pretty profound experience for me at the time. That I mean, I don't want to relitigate the whole thing. That was an incredible experience. And I, I went with that. I went similarly. I remember for about like 80 percent of the movie going like, like, I know the transcendental, all that. But like, this is an interesting Paul Schrader movie. And then when it turned, I was like, OK, this is a guy who wrote Taxi yeah, Driver. Like, yeah, there yeah, it is. Yeah. I see it. <laughs> I know uh, this killer- man. I know what this yeah. is. <laughs> exactly. So, Abby, um, you told me earlier that this was also your first viewing of raging bull and i'd love to just kind of hear and i imagine this will be the experience of a lot of the audience members i i don't imagine many of them have seen raging bull before this and and after our discussion i don't know how many are going to be sold on it frankly depending on what uh what you're coming to the substance for but how did it initially uh strike you on your first viewing well first of all my my only exposure to raging bull prior to i guess like reading about it really and then actually watching the film was uh, the scene from Waiting for Guffman where uh, one of the sure. people who's auditioning for the play does a scene from Raging Bull and it's the scene between uh, Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci where he's asking whether or not they've had an affair, his wife and his brother, um, in much more vulgar language. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was my only knowledge of the movie for years. But uh, watching it finally, like it's this is such an interesting portrait of of toxic masculinity really essentially um, sure. is what I came away with it uh, away from watching the movie with. Um, and I've done a little bit of reading in the interim. Uh, I was reading Roger Ebert's write up of it uh, right before this. And it seems like he more or less agrees that it's sort of a, a portrait of a self punishing, very insecure person. Um, 
and the damage that he causes himself and others by being that way. Yeah, absolutely. No, I used to kind of joke tongue in cheek that this was my favorite, like feel bad movie. This is a movie that I, I adore. It means a lot to me. I mean, especially in the first like 15, 20 minutes. So I growing up an Italian American who loved film Scorsese was like this, uh, sacred figure in my household. My dad spoke very reverentially, um, of his films. I mean, my dad was a contemporary, like he was born the exact same time as, uh, De Niro and Scorsese. And he grew up with them. And when it, I probably watched Goodfellas far too young and I loved it. And I was like, that's what I want to do too. Like, wow. Uh, so that I, I had that whole upbringing and then they did not show me raging bull for a while, but I remember the first time I saw it, um, it literally felt like my grandparents' old photo books, like come to life, like the, the tenement housing and the public pools, like the stuff of his, his early life kind of before everything took off for him. This, that just felt like so real. So I've, I've always had a very special place in my heart for this. We should probably actually talk about the movie overall for people who don't know. So raging bull, Martin Scorsese's uh, Oscar winning film came out in 1980. So Jake LaMotta really is the central figure of the movie. The script went through a few different iterations and evolutions. And I'm really glad that when they brought Paul Schrader in, I don't know how much you kind of read up on, on the background. Paul Schrader added the, uh, the Joe Pesci character of the brother for this. was This was pre-internet days when they were writing the script. So the first, the first draft of the script was based on the book, Jake LaMotta's, memoir which surprisingly was not very uh he, he did not present a very polished view of himself the book was way worse than the movie but in the book he omitted his brother probably for various reasons and then paul schrader doing research on it discovered he had his brother they're falling out and all that and then when they added that character to the movie then it's like okay we can tell a full story here this isn't just a terrible guy spinning out for two hours because that's in and of itself, that's kind of a hard sell. So I kind of felt like the uh, the brother story was was really an anchor for the whole thing. Yeah, I would agree. I feel like the relationship between those two men is really, I mean, it's it's extremely important. And it's also a really interesting pattern to see how like both of them become married over the course of the film and seeing how each of them treat women, how similarly they treat women and also like in some some differences as well like uh jake lamada definitely has a lot of paranoia that his brother does not i do think that there's a lot of insecurity that they share and that insecurity is essentially what eventually tears them apart i mean we could talk later about the uh quote unquote redemption or attempt at redemption that jake makes at the end of the film which i do not believe is reciprocated at all well, but, yeah um, i mean we, we can I, jump I thought, all over i mean i i was thinking a lot about that scene um yeah. preparing for this so they they start out um, antagonistically, but very warmly with each other before uh, Jake's career really takes off. Before he he meets in his second wife and starts a family and kind of gets gets that part of his life going. Then they have the falling out due to his paranoia, which I and mean, we can talk about some of the technique later as well. Amazing with the uh, cinematography and the editing, mm-hmm. which is a sidebar. It lost the Oscar for Best Director. I think Thelma absolutely deserved the Oscar for Best Editing. Shameful. I mean, there, there's a lot of Oscar flubs that everybody likes to point out. I, I think it's just the most insane thing in the world that he didn't win Best Director oh, yeah. for this. Absolutely wild. But so, yeah, his paranoia tears everything apart. But then at the end, yeah. there is a scene of yeah, I agree. redemption. And Perhaps is there? What, what was your reading uh, on the on your initial viewing? What was your what was your reading on that? Redemption question mark. <laughs> I think the my reading on my on the initial viewing. So this is like right near the end of the film. Uh, this is like when... twelve years after the body of the movie. So there's uh, yeah. the book ends are twelve years in the future of the the body of the movie. Yeah, uh, and so Jake has retired from boxing he's doing these weird kind of pseudo stand-up comedy readings at nightclubs and yeah, he's, he's like a be... one-man show kind of like trying to regain some of the, yeah, the limelight it's, it's, for himself yeah it's like a weird combination of like muhammad ali rapping and just like carnival sideshow act it's very strange um 
but after one of his uh, nightclub stints, he happens to see his brother walking in the opposite direction. And so he follows him and like tries to catch up with him. And um, his brother, Joey, is trying to get into his car so he can leave. And he doesn't really seem like he wants to have anything to do with Jake. And Jake just won't stop talking to him. And it's just like, hey, I want to I want us to be brothers again. I'm sorry about what happened. And they finally like they finally kind of embrace. I'd say it's arguable that Jake makes them hug. Um, oh, no, he and, absolutely does. He, he's forcing yeah, that pretty hard. He's been like, like grabs Joe Pesci into this bear hug. Uh, yeah. His his brother just kind of looks at him askance and says, like, you can you can come by the house, come by the house sometime later and we'll talk. And like that absolutely to me is a thing that I would say to somebody that I'd never want to see again, (laughs) just to, just to kind of make them like calm down and say like, yeah, we can talk more about this at a future date. And then that future date surprise never happens. And which makes me sound like an incredibly petty person. I promise I'm not in the regular (laughs) habit, but that is something I have seen people do. And it just strikes me as like a kind of attempt but maybe something that Joey isn't quite ready for at that exact moment. And he's trying to kind of hold Jake at arm's length, maybe to the point where they can have a proper reconciliation in the future. But like, maybe now is not the time. I think it seems like his life has been a little calmer, a little better with Jake out of it. Yeah, I think I definitely took it as seeds of a possibility of hope. Mm -hmm. Like Jake has made, and we're (laughs) talking about the end at the beginning, where Jake has made his peace with what is left of his life after he kind of tore everything apart. Jake has kind of made peace with it. And then he, he sees Joey and he sees like, well, like maybe, maybe I could have that. Like the one yeah. thing that was kind of his center. And I took that as, as a grain of hope. And then the, the Bible verse at the end was just like, Hey, Basically, you you can't judge people because you don't know what they're going through. Essentially, it's like okay, right? Like, yeah. what what were your thoughts? Again, first time viewer, you don't have any of the the cultural baggage probably that I bring to it. What what were your impressions of yeah. the character Jake? Because I mean, I think that biopics or whatever you want to call them are very interesting, and I always prefer when they make them characters versus like mm-hmm. try to very strictly relay facts because yeah where you're trying to get that's not interesting and yeah it's not cinematic and if you're just trying to coldly recreate a thing that happened that doesn't give the audience any anywhere to kind of implant themselves like Mm -hmm. versus taking the broad strokes and kind of telling a very human relatable story so i think there's a couple of key moments that popped up for me and I should say my, my family is Italian American too, but we're from California. So my, oh, okay. my experience is very different. And yeah, I, I tell people that we're like Olive Garden Italian. Like we, we, <laughs> we have the name, but I wouldn't say that we have any of the other stuff that goes with it. <laughs> Where was I going with that? Yeah. So just, just thinking about that a little bit, it's, it's always kind of interesting for me as, as somebody who doesn't have any of that baggage to like encounter what other people's like ethnic experiences have been when they're a little bit closer to that it feels a little bit like i don't know like i'm sorry i missed out on something but at the same time it just did you grow up in a very loud household no like a very small quiet household so wow um, okay yeah yeah like i i am an only child uh my dad actually has a lot of siblings so his his family and his dad is the one who was like the actual immigrant from italy um so that's that's a little bit closer to his experience but i think by the time that he grew up and wanted to settle down, he was ready for something a little more chill. So that's, yeah, that's what we are. <laughs> but there were a couple key moments for, for me in this movie that I think kind of helped me understand the themes a little bit better. And thinking about, thinking about like the partnership between Scorsese and Schrader also helped amplify those moments for me a little bit. There's one moment where like you see Jake training at the gym and he's essentially using Joey as a punching bag, which I didn't like. He's wearing the same equipment that he was wearing earlier. Joey is. In the film, yeah. and I didn't know what that equipment was for. And then you realize it's so that it's so that Jake can like punch him mercilessly. Yeah. And I that's that's such an interesting image to me that like explains a lot about like their dynamic, their relationship, the posturing while also really not wanting to let him down. And uh, which when Jake is eventually asked to throw the fight and does in a really obvious way that gets him in trouble just the sobbing they have after that, where it just, it feels like somebody who wanted to do right by somebody 
clearly screwed up, even though it wasn't really entirely his fault. And they're all just like trying to figure out what to do. Yeah. Is I think that's that's a really beautiful moment. It's a really sad moment. Um, another thing I found interesting was that um, all of the boxing scenes, while they take place in different, like you're told that they take place in different places around the country, they all look the same. All the rings look exactly the same. And they're filled with all of this, like this cacophony of noise that, um, well, I was reading the the Roger Ebert write up um, goes a little bit into the sound design of it. So there's like, it's an actual, yeah, incredible it's work. Like there's, there's people, ver- like there's people's voices, obviously there's bird noises that are just kind of filtered in, which you don't even really notice in the mix, but like, it just makes it I louder. can't tell you how many times I've watched the movie and then really watching it for this like yeah. catching those the animal noises i was like i never noticed those before yeah and the flash bulbs that go off are like the sounds are like panes of glass that are being shattered so it sounds a lot bigger and louder than it actually would be in real life oh yeah it's um, very violent yeah and so it's like all of that noise the darkness around it so you can't really like get any establishing details of like where you are other than a boxing ring and all of these faces around you, it just, it feels like hell to me. <laughs> it feels like a vision of hell. And this is somebody who is like willingly putting himself in that situation just week after week and month after month, um, separating himself from people that he loves so that he can go to these kind of faceless places and just get beaten up. And it just kind of leads you to think like, what kind of person would want this for himself? Which leads you to further questions about like, who is this person? Why does he act this way? Why does he think this way? And I think it kind of all comes to a head. Uh, and like, it's late in the movie when uh, Jake is in jail, uh, essentially for letting underage women into his club and making out with them. And he does this, he he like starts punching the wall and just yelling like, why, why, why? Which reminded me, and I, I think this is in, intentional of the the scene in The Master, um, near the end of The Master, where Joaquin Phoenix is just like banging his head against the um, the bunk bed that's chained to the wall in like a similarly repetitive and self-destructive motion and just yelling like, why, why, why? First of all, reminded me that Paul Thomas Anderson has taken away a lot from this movie <laughs> um, oh, yeah. in ways that I found really interesting. Um, but also I think there's just a similar vein of like, like the message from Paul, like, why do I do the things that I repeatedly don't want to do? And like the instincts that drive us to, to do things that we regret and to do things that hurt other people in sometimes very grand ways. And sometimes that comes from a lot of like real personal hurt. And sometimes that comes from deeper stuff that we need to acknowledge, but refuse to. And that, I think that was the point where everything all kind of gelled for me. And I was like, oh, this is actually a really profound film. Like, I mean, it was for sure up to that point. But that was the moment where I was like, this is great. The jail cell? Yeah. Yeah. Man, that like that brings me to tears every time. And I, I can't imagine what that's going to be like s- seeing that in a theater. So yeah, I that, that is the culmination of so many things you mentioned the bird noises, but there are so many. I watched the, um, the making of documentary and they played the specific scenes where you saw it. And then when I rewatched it, I caught several of them. There are animal noises, um, cut into just about every fight scene. And the one that I absolutely didn't catch before was when Jake goes to attack Joey, the thing that really does break them up after he was paranoid and, and berating his wife until she like, not even made up a confession. She's like, what do you want me to say? Like that, like she clearly was just talking, but yeah. she like said yeah. out loud, she said out loud his worst fears and it just set him off so bad that he beat Joey half to death. And in that scene where he's just attacking Joey in his home in front of his family, there's also some animal noises in there as well. And then when you go back to the initial first scene, before he um with his first wife and his family the the big fight that they get into is one of his neighbors outside is calling him an animal just and that's kind of like oh like an yeah. ethnic thing but and he's like oh what are they a bunch of animals like talking about the crime like just this whole this striving for like dignity and personhood that he both desperately wants but also kind of doesn't really believe he's worthy of or for yeah. whatever reason can't either can't attain or can't believe that he 
he he can have or he he's worth having. Um, you talked about all the fights. They're they're very similar. The the rings were all constructed. All of that was shot in sound stages, and each fight was designed to have a very specific feel. And actually, one of them you mentioned hell. One of them was actually designed to look like to to evoke like hell. And mm-hmm. the the storyboards that uh, Scorsese was looking at and copied a couple beats from the final Sugar Ray fight. He took those that's, from yeah, Psycho. That's what I was going to ask about. <laughs> yeah, it's the final Sugar Ray fight because it really feels like the way that they shoot Sugar Ray in that. Also, he just looks like this demonic wraith. It's wild. That they seen first. There were a number of number of specific shots where Scorsese recreated the Psycho shower attack mm. with Sugar Ray being the killer and the blood mm-hmm. going down his legs and the, the glove going in like the knife, like those were, he's like, this is like a horror scene right here. For sure. And, and it's, I mean, it's also similarly like made up of a bunch of really quick cuts just in quick succession, just like boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Just relentless. Mm-hmm. But, but this is a man where that is where he, he finds his value. And, and you talked about it before. He's just getting beat to death. Like, Jake LaMotta in real life, his thing and the character in the movie is that he can take a beating and he's not affected. Like the, the, the scene where he's supposed to throw the fight and he mm-hmm. just, he just stands there with his hands at his side and just let the other guy just beat the daylights out of him. He's like, well, I didn't go down. Like I, I can take it like whatever you've yeah. got. Like I can take your punishment Maybe on a subconscious level, I deserve this punishment for some reason. I don't know. Yeah. And I think it's it's worth noting, too, that um, the fight scenes are incredibly juicy. <laughs> um, yeah. It's just, yeah. Like, I was, again, like, I was reading up a little bit about how those are created. Like, there are sponges in the gloves. There's, like, tubes that are connected to people's hair where, like, it'll just, like, it allows, like, fluid to escape <laughs> so that, like, all of the the spurts and splatters are just like sweat and blood and like everything just everywhere. Um, it's, it's funny that like when, um, when Shutter Island came out, everybody was like, Oh, this is Scorsese's horror movie. And like, at the time I was like, I didn't know that he could make horror movies. And now watching this and I was like, why hasn't he made more? Like, this is good. Well, yeah. Like Cape fear. I feel like it's not his best, but I feel like it's underrated. Like, yeah, he really has got some chops. Absolutely. I mean, that's a stupid. That's the stupidest thing I've ever said on the show. <laughs> Mark, Scorsese that, that's has some Scorsese chops. Kid. He's got some chops. No, but like people I mean, think of him as the one that like Hugo, incredible. I can't wait for the crazy yeah. loaded out Arrow edition that's coming out soon. Like the man, like when he gets focused on stuff, I, I haven't loved everything he's ever done, and I still have a couple that I need to check off uh, my list. But I mean, he, he when he catches the vision, I don't think there's anybody that can touch him that's alive right now. Yeah, no, I agree. It's he's really really dialed in and like the older I've gotten the more I appreciate just how deeply he thinks about stuff and how deeply he cares about like the stories that he's telling and the people whose stories he's telling um and I mean and when he works with Schrader just like I I feel like it goes to another philosophical and theological level where you get just like both of their religious backgrounds um Schrader's weird bugaboos about sex, which we can also talk about. Oh my um, goodness! That let's say that that is very. You know about the jail scene, his whole thing with that. No, tell me. Oh boy, that's interesting. We'll save that one for a second. So uh, we mentioned this, I think, on the first reformed episode. Just kind of this, like Scorsese Schrader, the combo is so fascinating because they, there are several actually. There, there are more than I realized. Somebody just mentioned one on a podcast not too long ago that I listened to two guys who before they pursued a career in film, they both seriously um, pursued theological training and ministry. Mm -hmm. They they both were going to be priests or pastors. Like they, they first thought like my life is like my vocation might be in the church. And then through various things, they realized that the arts were their calling and their path. But neither one of them, obviously, like, could fully or wanted to fully like th- those things are so deep in all of their work. Uh, but mm-hmm. when they come together, it's it's very special. <laughs> so Sugar Ray fight. One thing before we move on to some of these other things, are you at all aware of uh, Samuel Fuller, writer director? Scorsese drops I mean, his name a lot. 
Yeah, just in in kind of a cursory sense. I don't think I've seen a ton of Sam Fuller films, but yeah, I know who he is. I'm a big Sam Fuller evangelist. One of the uh, one of my favorite things that I learned from the commentary track I, I watched um, pr- to prepare for this is the one Sam Fuller is a very like in your face like aggressive like most people think of him as like a B movie director but yeah. he used to be a he started out <laughs> when he was a teenager in New York way back in the day as a crime reporter when he was a teenager like yeah, that covering right. like he looks like a guy vi- who has been violent crimes stuff like that and then he was in the war and then he became a filmmaker so his stuff was always like you got to grab the audience by the throat and the one shot that had the camera on the boxing glove like going into De Niro's face like that yeah. was Sam Fuller tell it <laughs> like that was his idea to Martin he's like you you got to have a shot that's like on the glove going into his face and that's I was great. I was very happy to learn that He's, yeah. he's one of my favorites. So whenever I, I get that. a shot, I was like, everybody should check his stuff out. Yeah, it's it's great when other directors show up and other directors work so that you have like a sense of like people who mean a lot to other people. And maybe you should check mm-hmm. out their stuff as well. It's like it's maybe the nicest calling card a person can get. And I've seen this movie probably 10 or more times. I didn't realize until watching with a commentary track, Scorsese appears in the movie and you see like like a fifth of his face. He's the guy yeah. at the very end telling Jake to go on. And that's, I never caught that before either. I felt, felt like an idiot when I saw this. Like, Oh, there he is. Cause yeah. usually yeah. he's think... not always in his movies, but when he is, he's like, there he is. Cause it's Martin yeah. Scorsese. he. And isn't his father in, in raging bull as well, just for like a little bit. Yeah. The he's uh so like the big main gangster. Um, he's, uh, sitting next to him in the scene where he's at the coke yeah. and he tells him to come over and he's like, Hey, like when he's like trying to just drink water, ginger ale to prepare for the fight and he's not like eating big or drinking. He's trying to cut his weight. He's one of the the gangsters sitting there, which um, it kind of I, I think it's a it's a good lead into I'm I'm curious about your your connection to the, the depiction of community in this movie, because I feel like that is so vivid and vibrant. And one of the things that I like about the fact that this movie is shot in black and white and looks as old as it does is that it mm-hmm. feels like it has a real reverence for a specific time and place and vibe um and like the first time that we meet vicky uh is uh jake lamata's second wife played by kathy moriarty who is just the coolest in this movie oh my gosh just like veronica lake wells a bombshell um absolutely yeah yeah the way that she shows up at the pool the first time and the like the edits that like the cut there like her her legs in the water her uh, her swimsuit and the way that like all the guys are fawning over her and like how everybody's gathered at the pool. It just like has this real visceral sense of like, you feel like you're there. And I wondered if you had that, that same level of connection. Well, yeah, I mean, I, so my, my father's parents, my father's grandparents immigrated and then his parents, I, some, I believe my grandparents were actually born in Italy and then some of their younger siblings were born after they came here. So they came to New York and they, like I said, their photo albums, like that's like the hot New York summer. They all mm. lived in apartments, like on top of each other. Like that felt like I saw pictures of them at their community pool. And I was like, like, that's it. Like <laughs> I've never been, um, I've, I've never been to see those neighborhoods. Like I still have some old Italian family, in New York, but I, I I've never been there, but the stories like, I, we grew up like in a weird time, like pre internet and like, te- like the technological boom in our life, like is such a wild thing. Like mm-hmm. their photos and their stories, like painted such a vivid picture. And I re- like, I truly wonder, like with all the stimuli that kids have, like, I wonder what like a photo book and a story is going to do for like my kids. Like, I hope it has the same power that like my grandparents like did when they, they passed those on to me. But I, that's a sidebar, but yeah, it, it really seemed to evoke that, that community, uh, and both Scorsese and De Niro, like that was their story. Mm-hmm. They were just kids who found each other. They had passions, they had talent, and they tried to lift themselves up kind of the whole American dream thing. Like we have talent and Joey was Jake's like trainer. He was his manager. He's like, my brother can take a beating like that's our ticket out of here. Like that's our, our ticket up in the world. And you saw he was, Joey was like 
the the schmoozer and the networker he's like yeah i know the gangsters i know the guys who run the clubs i know the guys who run the fighting matches like he's just trying to see all the angles of everything just to like help them improve jake through his his paranoia and his character like some of it you say like okay like he's got principles but then also he beats his wife and treats everybody terribly like it's such an interesting he's a very complex figure and de niro has spoken for years i I don't know what your thoughts are i'd be interested to hear what you think in in your read overall de niro has spoken for years it's like i don't think the character in the movie of jake is, is a completely like reprehensible all bad guy like obviously he does terrible things but like there's humanity in there and i'm like the nature and nurture i it didn't show his childhood you don't always need to see oh here's the origin of somebody who does terrible stuff to understand why they're broken but the fact of the matter is like we're all formed and malformed by things that happen to us and our environment and to see the person he was at a relatively young age you're like man like what happened to that guy and yeah. then the two best relationships he has, Vicky and Joey, like what he does to that. Like you talked about the scene where eventually Vicky Lamada, but when Vicky's at the pool and everybody's kind of like just stunned by her, the fact of the matter is, is that Jake went up to her, setting aside, I guess, the morals of his, him leaving his first wife. Like mm-hmm. he won her affection and she truly cared for him. So you could say like he won, like great. Yeah. Obviously again, there's, there's a moral issue there, but for him, you'd be like, all right, man, you've got your career. Your brother's your manager. You're winning. You've got a shot at the title here coming up. You've got the girl that everybody wants. Like, aren't you happy? But like, because for whatever reason, internally and externally, like he feels like he doesn't deserve it. So at every stage he is both, questioning and sabotaging it um i I read a number of pieces i I thought the the roger ebert one was good yeah i I was looking at the roger ebert thing earlier today and i thought the his the closing of his piece really stuck with me says lamada was famous for refusing to be knocked down in the ring there are scenes where he stands passively hands at his side allowing himself to be hammered we sense why he didn't go down he hurt too much to allow the pain to stop. And just that idea of people who become comfortable in pain and, and you don't need to know why exactly. And that's where as a character, as a viewer, like we can have a way into that. Like you don't have to be an Italian American immigrant. You don't have to be uh, an athlete. You don't have to be like, terribly paranoid and neurotic about your relationships to find your way into like this guy for whatever reason, like feels like that's what he deserves. And he is, he has become comfortable with uh, yeah. Discomfort and chaos. And I mean, I, I certainly relate to that more than I would like at times. And I mean, I, I think that people can look at that and go, okay, like, I get that. Obviously not Jake LaMotta role model, but character of Jake LaMotta, like human. And you want to root for improvement, not you want to be like, ah, this cheating wife beater, uh, degenerate is is not all that bad. It's like, no, he's a human who is striving in his way. Yeah. No, I, I would agree with that. It's like every, once his paranoia kind of starts to assert itself, which is very shortly after he is married to Vicky, and it, I think you kind of see little bits of it hinted at before then, but like that's oh, yeah. when it really comes out to play. Is like she kind of offhandedly mentions that the guy that he's about to fight um, is is good looking, just objectively good looking, and that sure. just seriously bothers him. Like, what do you mean good looking? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What do you mean good looking? And then when he fights the guy and like just punches his face into oblivion. Like he looks at her and is like, well, so what? He's not pretty anymore, as one of the gangsters says to the other one. But um, just every choice that he makes to um, to distrust her, to estrange her, and then later to estrange his brother, who arguably he has, I mean, obviously he has an even closer relationship with because that's his brother and they've known each other their entire lives. It just like you feel, you feel horrible for him. <laughs> you feel like, 
A, like you you wish that he hadn't made that decision. And then also you kind of fall back on just this events kind of empathy of just like, I I am sorry that you feel that badly that you feel like this was this was the way that you had to react or like that everybody around you is not worthy of your trust because you aren't worthy of your trust and you're not worthy of having people around you who you trust. And just having that be the thing that defines your entire life is like, it's. It, I think it would be different if it presented itself as egomaniacal posturing, mm-hmm. but I don't think it does. It just, it constantly seems like insecurity and pain and always having that be met with people just like flat out denying it or getting mad at them which understandable um, because sure. you're being accused of everything that you didn't do, but instead of just like meeting him with compassion and saying, why do you feel this way? You don't need to feel this way. Like you are, you are loved. You are worthy. Um, yeah. Not a whole lot of therapy and uh, self care right. there. Back yeah. In which the, I think there are the a lot. Day. I think probably they're, I mean, they're all a product of their time and place. Like that's not, yeah. that's not how you deal with situations. <laughs> if you, if you grow up, you know, in a certain community and with certain, like with, if that is your example that is set for you, you're probably not going to have great conflict, you know, conflict dealing skills. <laughs> well, man, um, oh man. I mean, I, I absolutely relate to that. Like, and I grew up like in a pretty darn like loving Christian home and all that. Yeah. But I mean, when the big family was together, like everybody's yelling at each other. I've been smacked in the face by people I love and I didn't take it in a bad way. I'm just like, I probably shouldn't have said that. Like, It's, it's a, it's a different thing. And I was in like the best type of that. Like I couldn't imagine like immigrant trying to scrape by with all those nature and nurture things that are very rough and kind of aggressive and violent, like gone bad. Like those, one of the most haunting scenes in the movie for me every time is those two kids when Mm -hmm. Jake is beating Joey to death after Vicky finally just starts talking crazy, saying all this stuff sets him off he goes to like beat joey and his kids are just standing there like the mom gets him out of the way initially to like because he is like he is like a rhino just tearing through their apartment but then Mm -hmm. after they're like okay he didn't like knock the kids over on the way to joey the kids are just standing there watching their uncle beat their dad like into a coma and And his daughter especially i think i think she doesn't even get out from the table she's like she's still sitting there and she has like just the smallest hint of a smile on her face because like before this joey was like smacking his own son around for like not eating his food properly and just like instead of talking to him kindly like a father should yeah he gets a bit stereotypical italian dad a little bit a little bit and uh just the look on her face like it it's not like a grin or anything but it's just kind of like a "Mm mm-hmm like you had that coming I'm like I'm not sure he did, and <laughs> I, I didn't you... quite read it like that. But that is an no, interesting, re- like, yeah, no, I think I don't think it is necessarily that fully. But it's just like kind of seeing this happen and having well, had, like seeing a like, kid who is like it. The fact that it's not shocking, and I mean, obviously, kid actors, I'm sure they're yeah. having like it sounds like they all had a great time shooting. But yeah. Martin Scorsese <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> he said like they were like trying to get a reaction out of them, like. They would yeah. like go extra big to try to get like like oohs and ahs and like startled, but like the kids were just like interested. But yeah. like the what you can put into that as the viewer of like this is what they're used to. Right. This is this like and like you said, they just had low level violence at the table, and this is this is up a number of notches. Yes. But like it's not it's not fundamental, fundamentally different. Yeah. I think it's just maybe, maybe what I'm thinking is that like it, they see it as like a series of escalating consequences. Like this is what happens. And then this thing happens and then this thing happens. And that's just the way that it is. Um, And I feel like you kind of see that in the way that like that Jake deals with conflict. You can see like how somebody who grew up that way might become a fighter (laughs) um, because like, that's what they know. Um, And you can see how like that would, potentially be pretty detrimental to relationships that you try to have with people whether or not they are also used to that in their own in their own homes i feel like there's no situation in which that's going to go well um and it just kind of perpetuates itself in a in a really sad but compelling dramatically kind of way well in what you were saying before i want to kind of follow that thread like him constantly 
just wrecking everything because he doesn't feel like he deserves anything good to where that all culminates, where it's in the future and he's in the jail by himself, completely stripped of all of all pride, of all relationships. He's going to be in there for a little while and he's just alone with himself and he he's beating the wall. He's smashing his head in the wall and he's saying, he's like, like, no, like I'm not an animal. Like, mm-hmm. and, he's, and I forgot exactly the line, but basically he's like, I'm a good guy or I'm not that bad. Like he, yeah, he is trying to articulate like in a weird way. Like it took him to be there to verbalize like, Oh, like, I I know like I I don't want this and it's it's terrible it's it's yeah. cathartic it's heartbreaking but it's like man like this is what that leads to again dramatically this is this is a character but I mean Jake Lamada really did, did go to jail because yeah. all this behavior got him there and then transition back into like fat club owning trying to go on do a tight little comedy set and schmooze with all of his guests at the club he's looking at himself in the mirror basically going like okay like this I, i'm gonna have to be okay with this yeah and basically saying like i'm okay with myself yeah you, you had everything like things go terribly after he he became the champion yeah Again, worth noting that the I'm I'm the boss, I'm the boss, I'm the boss scene and like the, the final yeah. shots of that is uh like it's directly copied at the end of Boogie Nights, um, which is I don't know, interesting in and of itself and follows maybe not the same trajectory, but kind sure. of a similar one. And it just yeah, it I think that's I don't know, having having seen both of those movies that like seeing Boogie Nights and seeing the master a number of times before seeing this really I feel like kind of gave me an insight into like, like the kind of things that maybe stuck with PTA after watching this. I mean, one from like a style perspective and I think with Boogie Nights, he was definitely like kind of stenting a little bit being like, I've seen Raging Bull, like so have a lot of people. But uh, (laughs) I think just that, that questioning of like, who is this person who makes these decisions? Um, How does, how does a person kind of make, the progression of choices that they do and end up with the people that they end up with and end up ruining those things and then bouncing back. Like what, what is going through that person's head? How do they feel about themselves? Um, how, how does the world feel about them? How do they feel about the world? Like there are a lot of questions you can ask. Um, and in this particular case, yeah. When, when Jake's in the jail saying, I'm not that guy, it's, but, but he is, he is that guy. And I think yeah. maybe he, I, I don't know when, when I say that, like I say that, regretfully of just like you know know that you have made these choices own up to the things that you've done realize that you don't want to be this person and then you can choose something else um i think maybe what we get in the the end of that movie is that like he's he's made peace with the fact that he is a raging bull and he's just going to be angry and he's gonna be the kind of person that he's always been and just kind of barrel through life and what happens happens because he doesn't know how to stop it um which is tragic I think it's, I mean, it, it doesn't end on a happy note and I think that's intentional, obviously. So yeah, as the viewer, you can look at that, the, the jail cell scene to the time jump to him at the club. You can kind of go like you, you have the option of hope or you have the option of cynicism. And it is interesting to kind of see how, because I mean, like you said, Joey is not like, Oh, hug and kiss. Like, let, let's go over. Like, let's have dinner. It's just like, yeah, like, I'll call you in a few days. Like Mm -hmm. that, that could be a put off. That could be hope. And I mean, how do you end a movie like raging bull? And I feel like that's the best possible ending to, uh, if you're going to try to, I don't tie up the narrative threads and give some sort of thing where you're not just like, Oh, like that was like, cause I mean, the movie puts you through a ringer. It does. Yeah. Talking about the, the losing, of what he has. I think the, the little segment, maybe my favorite part of the whole movie is the, the home movie segment that kind of actually mirrored and copied Jake LaMotta's real home movies, mm. but uh, shows like them courting, getting married and kind of things falling apart. It's totally silent. 
it's shot um it's actually in color <laughs> it's the one mm-hmm. part of uh color in the whole movie and this was kind of I- insane uh Thelma Schoonmaker was telling the story of uh when the movie came out she would go to different theaters to kind of see how it was being projected and a couple of different projectionists were going to try to cut that part out because they're like, oh, this is a black and white movie. Like this color part doesn't belong in there. They must have made a what? mistake. So like some it had it cut out Thelma. entirely. Some she's like, no, 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 no. Like that absolutely <laughs> belongs in there. So it sounds like some people in 1980 probably missed the home movie scene, which is a real bummer because it's extremely powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, but you just get to see what Jake's pathology kind of does to something beautiful Mm -hmm. and it's it's heartbreaking and you go like that's unnecessary and like what what does that what does that leave me with like what what can i do how can i how can i avoid that how can i encourage others in my community to avoid that and i mean i think raging bull i don't know if i would call it like a hopeful movie Mm -hmm. but it is one that like i think is very human and yeah. e- even though it doesn't always make you feel good, like I-, I do love it so much because I feel like it portrays like thinking about what one wants to avoid, like the, a-, a tragedy, I feel like can be just as valuable as something uplifting and feel good when you go like this is this is a real thing. Like we've we've got seeds of this in all of us. And I mean, in the Ebert review and on Thelma's part of the commentary talking about some of the jealousy like i i don't know all of scorsese's relational life i know that he's had a number of marriages and relationships um, Mm -hmm. but it sounds like the jealousy aspect was kind of his way into a lot of that and he was kind of putting himself there like he obviously wasn't as violent and crazy but he's like yeah "Yeah, like this i relate to this and i mean i relate to some of the like I really need to keep my temper in check sometimes. Like, and I, I don't want those things to happen. And like, whatever our deal is, I feel like we can look at it kind of as a cautionary tale of this is what can happen. This is the destruction that can. And it's a picture of what did happen in the man's life. But like, this happens all the time. My pastor has said on a number of occasions, um, uh, he, he's, he describes sin as, um, legitimate needs, met by illegitimate means essentially Hmm. um and i feel like this is this is kind of an example of that of just like legitimate need for um, security yeah security validation love um but in the absence of those things or the seeking of those things like telling yourself that you don't deserve it or that nobody else around you believes that you do and so Therefore, instead of taking a posture of gratitude when things go well, just making sure, like either trying to hold something too close until it goes bad and then telling yourself demanding love and devotion. Yeah. From those around. Demanding it from people who, you know, have their own needs that you can also help meet and feel good meeting, by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just, yeah, I think it's, it's, it depends on the posture that you take. And I feel like this is a, this is a really good, I think, yeah, a cautionary tale of like what can happen when that posture is not one of humility and gratitude, but one of um, (laughs) self-hatred that you refuse to acknowledge as such. Well, and I think another reason looking at it more critically for this, uh, one of the reasons I think that De Niro has kind of been pretty vocal about, no, I, I don't just see Jake as a monster or a terrible guy. He physically, I don't, even, I don't think we talked about this yet. He physically put himself through, like he trained for a year to yeah. get into the fighting shape just for those like, like 15 minutes in this two hour and 10 minute movie, 15 yeah. minutes of actual fights. But like his body is, is a specimen in those scenes to, he went from what is probably, if not the best, one of the best shapes he's ever been in his life to, the beginning and the end of the movie, he put that weight on himself to really feel like, what would it be to like go from like this, this athlete at the top of his game, pure physical specimen to this like bloated guy who has trouble like walking and breathing. And when he looks in the mirror, he's not happy. Like 
De Niro went through that physically. So the yeah. empathy is like baked into the movie. Like he's not wearing prosthetics. Like that's, <laughs> that's not De Niro in a fat suit. That is him. He went, they shut down production for four or five months. He went to Italy that's right. so and just that ate weight, nonstop, yeah. put on yeah. 60 pounds, came back. And the producers literally didn't recognize him when he came back. I mean, this is maybe, I don't know. I, I would I would like people who actually have experience with body dysmorphia to talk about this, but I feel like there is a way to watch this movie through the lens of body dysmorphia. Um, and uh, like, and specifically in, in his relationship to weight, like there's, that happens. That like, weight is a whole thing the through movie, the whole movie. Is, yeah. Yeah. It's throughout. Um, so like, even when he is in good shape, people are saying that he weighs too much. Like he's trying to get down to 155 pounds, I think is that the goal weight to try and, like I don't remember, but like, weight is a thing throughout literally his entire career in the whole movie. It he's he's worried about the weight always. Yeah, yeah. And then the minute that he is no longer like there, are, it, we 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 shoot forward in time by quite a bit. But by the time we see him next, like he has gained a lot of weight. Like he's no longer in fighting shape, and his like belly is hanging out over his belt. Like he's he's definitely not the person that he was. And I feel like that's. I, I don't know. I'd, I'd love to talk to somebody about the potential psychology in that too, because I'm sure that there's, there's something to be discussed. What that does to him, like as a <laughs> character, you, I, I don't think you could walk away from that experience and just caricaturize it. Cause like you, he lived that experience. Robert De Niro lived that experience. And right. I, I don't think it's healthy. I'm glad no. that people don't do that a lot. And, I think yeah. it's very silly that Christian Bale did it in American Hustle, not a Raging Bull status movie. Like, yeah, I think I'm, it was kind I'm, of a I'm wild thing. About, <laughs> I'm concerned about the, the things that Christian Bale puts his body through. His I, body, yeah, that's insane. I'm a little surprised he's like alive and functioning yeah. well. It's the yeah, wild he, ups I and think, downs. Yeah, once he hits a certain a certain point in his life, which I uh, honestly I assumed that would have come by now. I mean, I, he's not. There young. comes a point where your body just can't take it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm wondering when that's going to happen, but I, I am, I bet he's probably gone through the most change. Like, did oh, he do I'd the machinist so. yeah. and Batman back to back? Mm hmm. And American Psycho, not long before the machinist to just like, go yeah, he, from, he, went, like, he did American Psycho, the machinist, Batman, like that. It's is not insane. good to go through like extremes that are that intense, man, like that close together. Absolutely not. But well, and then yeah. at his age, he did American hustle, which is just so silly that he put all the weight on for that. Which is fine. I I saw it and I literally don't remember it. All that to say, I think it's a wild, potentially very irresponsible choice to make. But in this instance, I I think it's very powerful. I I I recently heard an actor on on a podcast talk about like how like you you have your work, like you have your body of work that you leave behind, and it is what it is. And I I think Raging Bull, in my mind and in my book one of the best things that American cinema has produced. And Martin Mm -hmm. Scorsese, who is one of the American giants, I I think it is his best film. It's, it's not always Mm -hmm. like feel good. I don't know if every day I'd say it's my favorite, but I think it is him and all the artists involved at the very top of their game. Yeah. I think it's the more that I think about it, the more that I've read about it and heard about it and talking with you about it too. Like it's clear that everybody who was involved in this had just really deep connection to the story, the characters, the material, the setting. Like this was all, this was stuff that meant a lot to the people making it. That's really apparent in every part of it. Well, it truly isn't. I mean, this, this show isn't like a behind the scenes because this is for the the average person who kind of wants to think substantively. But a little background on this movie is Scorsese had a, he was like a hot director at the start and he just came off a major, major, critical dud and a big money loser for the studio he was depressed he was on drugs and he goes i'm probably gonna quit and just move to europe and make documentaries this thing isn't gonna work out so like this is gonna be my last big swing Mm -hmm. i'm gonna put all out all the stops like it took de niro like almost a decade to convince him to even do it because he didn't like sports he's like i don't know what this is so a lot of people think of and i i call raging bull like Obviously, you say it's about a boxer, but it's like two hours and 10 minutes and about two hours of that is not in the ring. It's it's about a boxer and 
he finally found his way in. And I mean, he, he made Ray, Martin Scorsese says he made raging bull. Like it was his last movie and it really shows. So you mentioned it was already a good year for movies. Uh, move over to substance shout outs. You want to shout out some stuff. It doesn't have to be movies, but if that's, that's kind of your lane, I know sure. what, uh, feel free to throw out a few like old or new, like I would love to hear what you've loved so far this year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm a huge fan of Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. Um, I've been hearing nothing but good things about that. Oh, it's so wonderful. It's just very sweet and thoughtful and treats a very tender subject with a lot of personal love and care in a way that very much comes through. And I've loved hearing stories from friends who have like gone to see it with their kids, who went to see it with friends who like saw it in a packed theater with other people and their friends and their kids. And it just every, every story that I've heard about people going to see it has been wonderful. I also just saw uh, today Blackberry, which by the time this hits has been out for a couple of weeks. Um, Also been hearing great things about that. Yes. So I am not a huge fan of the recent trend of corporate origin stories. Like uh, I know it's irritating like air Tetris, like the it's either it's not worth it like Tetris is or if it's like air I have I have real beef with that movie I feel like that's like okay I don't I don't want to be the person who like calls something out as like sinful or mammon but like if there is that is it and at least that that's my take on it it's I hear both are good obviously air has more uh buzz because of the the high profile of people involved but I heard both of those are decent movies which is like yeah yeah, I'd much rather get to every man's story it's rather than yeah, so, like, here's a corporate that... triumph but blackberry kind of shows both sides right it does yeah so the thing that i think that blackberry does really well um is that it's it's a really accurate portrait of like the difference between like the people who are actually making the thing and the people in the corporate suite who are selling the thing and how the difference between those things is what caused the downfall of the company um and just looking at the many characters involved in that and just like the strengths and weaknesses that they bring to the table, how each of those things become issues that endanger and eventually create a downfall of a product. And it's just like, it's, it's so much more thoughtful about like the human and emotional cost of like doing business and making something that a lot of people have and use than air was where I felt like the message was very much like, this is the cost of being great and ingenuity and as a person with a day job who would much rather be doing my passion, just kind of looked at it and went, no, absolutely not. I'm not going to work late at my corporate job just so people can have fancy shoes. So, well, and also yeah. consumerism, like it's exactly. not, it's not, quite, it's not the triumph the of the human sweatshops. spirit. It's yeah. like, yeah. And I, and I'm a sucker for some of that too. But then when you go like, oh, sure. This is about marketing and consumerism. Yes. Like I'm it's, glad yeah. for the triumphs, but also yeah. now. Yeah. People are like scalping shoes, like they're like they're they're making a living scalping these shoes on eBay. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Cool it's that you just... got you you accomplished the thing you were going for, but what yeah. it's like, what has come of that? Yeah. So, like, the triumph of human ingenuity is one thing, but to have that kind of glorified in the form of empty yeah. capitalist product is is not a thing I love. So, at least I I love that BlackBerry gets that. Um, and communicates that in a way that I think is both entertaining and uh, intelligent. Um, and Glenn Howerton, like I'm excited yeah, to see him do a, do a real thing. And then also, just to put in a plug for my friend Sarah Welch Larson's book, um, she she will have done an event in New York after this comes out, um, or before this episode drops. But uh, she wrote a book on the Alien films, the theology of the Alien films, called Becoming Alien. Um, that I cannot recommend enough. Um, it's yes. very smart and thoughtful, academic in a way that is accessible and intelligent and not dry and not very long either. So you can uh, you can sit with it and uh, and really enjoy it and um, hopefully get into get into all of the alien movies, not just the first two. Yeah, and like likely future guest, I've talked to her about talking alien sometime, and she's Good. that's Wonderful. one of her favorite things to talk about. So, uh, Abby, where can folks find you online? And you want to uh, do a plug uh, for your upcoming book? Uh, you can find me on Twitter um, at Abby Olchesi. That's A B B Y O L C E S E. 
Uh, I also am the film editor at The Pitch, so you can find my work pretty regularly there. Um, also at Sojourners Magazine, where I have a column in their magazine and contributed through a few things freelance. Um, I'm also working on my first book, which uh, at the moment is titled Silver Screen Liturgy. It's a exploration of uh, film through the lens of the church liturgical year. Um, so if you're looking for things to watch along during uh, Advent, Lent, Easter, all that stuff, this is this is the book for you, I, I hope. Um, yeah, so that should be out uh, at some point in 2024. I'm not sure the date yet, but... Uh, Might have you back yeah. for that, because we're... Um... I don't know if IVP, what they all send out to folks, but have you seen their um, their little short books on the church year that they're putting out? We just did two of these. and Oh, excellent. Yeah, I'm I know they've been doing right a series. Now. The so, Lent uh, and uh, the Fullness of Time series. Oh, excellent. Yeah, um, I, I know that they've been doing a lot of stuff specifically with the liturgical year, um, and they've been having really great people working on those. So um, Silver Screen I, Liturgy, that's very yeah. exciting. Thank you. I'm excited about it, too. We'll be putting the links in the show notes. Um, I'm very excited when the pre-order comes up. We'll definitely be sharing that online. But uh, until then, Abby, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. This was great. So that was Abby Olchesi, local Kansas City film critic here. Hope you guys enjoyed that. And for anybody who made it out to our Screenland armor showing of the movie, uh, thank you. Uh, it's a great time. Hopefully that will be one of many Love partnering with Screenland. Love that we were able to do this and uh, excited maybe in the future uh, we can hopefully generate some of our own substantive cinema screenings there. But if you're a Kansas City local and you love movies, hopefully there'll be much more of that on Abby's side. Find her in the links in her show notes. Very excited for her upcoming book next year. Uh, you definitely be hearing more about that as soon as we get it. I cannot wait to get my hands on that one. So and I'm going to kick it over to editor Dave here for final thoughts. See you next time, everybody. Thanks, Phil. And thanks, Abby, for a great conversation. Be sure to follow us at The Substance Pod on all social media. Intro music supplied by Trevor Aiken and Vincent Edwards. All show art is from Anna Marinello and Vincent Edwards. The Substance Pod is hosted by Philip Marinello and edited by me, Dave Hallahan. Feedback, guest, or topic suggestions can be sent to thesubstancepod at gmail.com. You can also send voice messages over there or by calling 913-703-3883. If this show is something that has had a positive impact on you and it's something you want to show your love and support for, there are a few ways to do that. Word of mouth recommendations always go a really long way, as does any financial support. You can hit up the link in the show notes and become a monthly supporter at 5 or $10 a month. Phil and I have had some preliminary conversations about some perks, but as of right now, it's just a good faith monthly donation. If you want to give financially but monthly support isn't your thing, then you can hit us up on Cash App at dollar sign the substance pod. Join us again in two weeks for the next episode of The Substance. Sorry, Dave. Do not put that in the blue for real, please. You landed on the substance. It's it's a nicely edited show, so Yeah, I, I tell people that we're like Olive Garden Italian. Obvious. I mean, that's a stupid. That's the stupidest thing I've ever said on the show. Scorsese has some chops.